Hi, my name is Yasin Reski, and I'm part of the Developer Relations Engineering team on Android working on privacy. Today, I'll tell you everything you need to know about storage on Android, which APIs to use, and the best practices you should follow. Let's first have a look at how storage is architectured on Android. A device has a primary storage volume stored on flash memory or on hard drive where the OS and apps are located. When Android installs an app, it creates a directory for the app's internal storage on the same primary storage volume. It's private and accessible only to that app, so it's the right place to store anything confidential like databases, configuration files. Android also creates a directory for the app's external storage. It's another location to save app-specific files. Some devices may have limited space available on the primary volume, thus making the app external storage only available through a microSD card. As the external storage can be removable, you always have to check its availability before using it. Keep in mind that before Android 11, the app's external storage is readable and writable by other apps that have the right storage permissions. So don't store any sensitive information there. Both the app internal and external storage directories are deleted when the app is uninstalled. And finally, there's the shared storage, also known as the device external storage. It's a common location for all apps to contribute files that can be seen in file managers and photo gallery apps. Files added there aren't deleted after apps are uninstalled. The shared storage content is automatically indexed by MediStore, which is a content provider that keeps track of metadata for shared storage files. It's used by apps to efficiently fetch information on all media files. These different types of storage locations can change on different Android versions. So if you're using file paths, don't save absolute path references to files, but instead keep relative references from the root of these different storage locations. Now we'll look into scope storage. Up to Android 9, files in the shared storage were readable and writable by apps that requested the right permissions. On Android 10, we released a major privacy upgrade regarding shared files access named scope storage. When an app requests read external storage on this version, access to shared storage is restricted to media files like photos, videos, and audio files. Any other files like PDF, zip, or docx, known as document files, are accessible using the document picker, which leverages the storage access framework. The document picker allows the user to retain full control on which document files they give access to. We also introduced other changes to further improve privacy and the developer experience. Write external storage is deprecated, and adding files to the shared storage does not require any permission. Requesting explicit user consent with a dialog shown to them when modifying or deleting a media file is now required. And finally, Location metadata is removed from media files automatically, and to access them, you need to request access media location permission. Now we'll deep dive into common storage use cases. Let's say our app downloads some user data in a config file that you want to keep private. First, we'll use OKHttp. It's a popular open source library to create and execute our HTTPS request. We'll create our client, and now we'll get to the response. Once we get the response back, we double check that it has a response body. We rely on the .use method from the Kotlin standard library to close the underlying network socket automatically at the end of the lambdas to avoid any memory leaks. Finally, we save the request body into a file. As the file content is private, we'll save it into our app's internal storage using the context.filesdir property. To streamline our memory usage, we'll copy the request body content 
into our file by using streams instead of holding it entirely in memory. The Kotlin standard library has the .copy2 extension function to input stream instances to facilitate the copy towards output streams. Now, let's imagine that we need to download some large assets in our app that aren't confidential but are meaningful only to our app. So we would like to avoid polluting the shared storage with it. We would follow the same instruction as we did in our previous example, saving the big file to the internal storage as is the most available and performant storage location. Some devices may have limited space available on the primary volume, so we should check first if there is still some enough space there. If there is not enough space, we use the app's external storage directory. We should rely on the .get external files dir method, as the device may have extra volumes like a microSD card. Finally, if there is still not usable space, let's show a notice to the user explaining the situation. Now, our app needs to add files to the shared storage so the user can access them through other apps. If we want to add an image, we need to request the right external storage permission up to Android 9. On more recent devices, we don't need this permission anymore to contribute files into the shared storage, thanks to scope storage changes introduced in Android 10. For images, we will choose the pictures folder returned by the environment dot get external storage public directory method using the environment directory pictures constant. If we're adding a video, we will choose the movies constant folder. If it's a PDF file, we will choose the download folder, etc. Now that we copied the image into a new file, we need to scan the file using media scanner by providing its path and its mime type. It will index the file metadata inside MediaStore, making it visible when apps query this content provider. For the best performance, and access to more features like favorite, trashed, and pending files on Android 10 and above, we recommend using the MediaStore API to add files on the shared storage instead of relying on the file API. Check out our documentation for more details. Now let's go to another use case. Let's say we need to access document files, so we will rely on the document picker via the action open document intent. First, let's add the Jetpack activity dependency to our project if it's not there already. After that, we register our open document activity result, which will handle the intent result logic. If the user has selected a file, we'll have a URI that we can open using the content resolver. Finally, we launch our intent handler with the MIME types we want to filter on, and in this case, it's a PDF. The action open document intent is available on devices running Android 4.4 and higher. To access photos and videos on the shared storage on version up to Android 12 L, you had to request read external storage and implement your own UI for the user to select the different items. But wouldn't it be better to just use something simpler for developers and privacy-friendly for users? Say no more. In Android 13, we introduced the Photo Picker, a privacy-forward way to select for images and video. It doesn't require any runtime permission and has a better UX to access photos and videos. It's maintenance-free, and you can even limit the number of selectable items. You can integrate it in your code in just a few lines of code and it's backported to Android 11 and 12. In the upcoming months, cloud media providers like Google Photos will also be supported. The photo picker will seamlessly include backed up photos and videos to the selection grid, even if they are not saved on your device. Users will even see their custom and shared albums in the Albums tab. To use it, let's add the Jetpack Activity Dependency version 1.6 and higher to our project if it's not there already. After that, we register our Peak Visual Media Activity result, 
which will handle the intent result logic. It will use the photo picker when available on the device and fall back to document picker for older devices. If the user has selected a file, we'll have a URI that we can open using the content resolver. Finally, we launch our intent handler with a filter, image and video, image only, video only, or specific MIME type we want to filter on. And that's it. Three lines of code to select an image or video without permissions. If you want to keep access to a file even after your app is closed, you can call the take persistable URI permission to be able to keep access to them even after reboot. Your app may have a use case requiring this broad access like gallery photo backup. For these specific usages, we've introduced new permissions in Android 13 when targeting API 33 that provide access to specific types of media files, including images, video, or audio. You can read more about them in the documentations. Privacy and transparency have been tremendously improved over the recent releases of Android, with even UX enhancements like the photo picker. We're working on adding more APIs that keep the user in control of giving access while removing the need to request permissions on app sites. And lastly, as a recommendation for apps, rather than relying on file paths, which only offer access to local files and can be changed over different versions of Android, we're recommending to use URI to access files on Android. Have a look at our documentation for more details on the features I've presented today. Thank you.